Today is July 6, so I hope everyone had a good weekend. So this morning, we're joined by our very own Dr. Julie Honecker and Dr. Evelyn Baer. So they're right next to each other, uh, co-presenting. So Dr. Honecker um, is currently the Director of Vestibular and Balance Disorders Program here at the Head and Neck Institute. Um, she got her a PhD at University of Cincinnati and her postdoc fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And she's a, a specialist in the state of the art assessment and management of patients with, especially with balance, dizziness, and vertigo concerns. And then, second but not least, we have Lena Baer. So she's currently our uh, vestibular fellow. And she also is an expert in evaluating, diagnosing, and treating patients with hearing loss and tinnitus. So thank you so much, both of you guys. Uh, the talk is titled, Tiny Crystals, Big Problem, a discussion of typical and atypical forms of BPPV and the best practice approaches for the treatment of BPPV. So hand it over to you guys, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, and um, I appreciate everyone joining us after a holiday weekend. I'm Julie Honecker, and I'm going to be having um, Evelina Bear um, go ahead and kick us off for our presentation. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the clinical dilemmas we face in the vestibular clinic, um, and we oftentimes get referrals from uh, physicians or advanced practice providers and physical therapists with questions regarding our patient symptoms truly BPPV in nature, or could there be something else going on? So we're gonna talk about kind of a case-by-case -case approach and talking about some of the current literature, some things coming out of our lab and some forthcoming publications. Um, but one caveat is that um, Dr. Bayer and I are just gonna be discussing posterior canal BPPV, which is the most common form of BPPV. So there are other variants, um, but we won't be discussing those today. Maybe there'll be another opportunity. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to um, Dr. Bear, who is our vestibular fellow, who will be starting in just a few weeks at the Beachwood Family Health Center. Okay. So the learner outcomes from this presentation are one, hopefully you guys can describe the mechanism of BPVV, two, identify typical and atypical BPV presentations versus central anom anomalies in patients presenting with positional vertigo. And three, define BPV and understand the ramifications of intractable BPV on treatment considerations. So first, a quick review of the vestibular anatomy. The vestibular system consists of semicircular canals and our otolith organs, which include the utricle and the saccule. The semicircular canals are filled with endolymph, and on one end of the canal, there is the ampulla, which contains a gelatinous-like structure called the cuplea. Inside the cuplea, we have the receptor cells that facilitate signal transduction. So our semicircular canals detect angular acceleration in three different planes or rotational head movement. The utricle and the saccule contain a sheet of calcium carbonate crystals or otoconia, and these organs are linear accelerometers. So they detect motion in the horizontal and vertical planes and they also serve as our gravity sensing organs. So BPV is really an interplay between these two symptom, systems. Okay. Ooh, did I just press? Videos aren't going to work. Technology, gotta love it. One second. So like when you come in Monday morning and the audiometer doesn't work. <laughs> Got a little technology. It's, okay. it's all good. It's all good. Okay, hold on. Do this. Sorry, everyone. Okay, and we're back. 
okay. So typically the canals are not sensitive to gravity because the cuplea and the endolymph are the same density. But with BPV, the theory is, is that these degenerative endoconia dislodge from the utricle and migrate into a semicircular canal. And be it's because of the added mass from the otoconia, the semicircular canals now become sensitive to gravity and, and linear acceleration. Clinically, this is why patients experience symptoms with movement such as laying supine or looking upwards. Usually their episodes of vertigo are brief and maybe last a seconds to minutes in duration. But they can also have general imbalance with ambulation, which is due to the false signals from the vestibular system. So like Dr. Honecker mentioned, posterior canal BPV is the most common form of BPVV, and BPVV in itself is the most common peripheral vestibular disorder. But um, BPV can also be associated with other vestibulopathies such as vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, and Meniere's disease. So here is an example of the classic nystagmus profile that you'll see during the Dix Hall Pike with posterior canal BPV. So, um, there's a torsional upbeating nystagmus, and it should follow a crescendo decrescendo pattern. And the response while you have them laying supine in the position should, shouldn't last longer than 60 seconds. So when a patient moves from supine to sitting, sometimes there can be a reversal in the torsional component of the nystagmus. So this patient just sat back up you can tell from the goggles, and then you'll see a reversal and the torsion there, right on cue, perfect. Okay. One point of reference, if you go back to yeah. this slide, is that this nystagmus profile is for the typical posterior canal BPPV presentation, which is having the otoconia or canalis displaced within the long arm of the canal itself. Mm -hmm. There are variants where the otoconia can be adhered to the cupula or close to the cupula, and with that, the duration of the nystagmus can last longer than 60 seconds. But this is the most common presentation type. Mm -hmm. And like Dr. Honecker mentioned, they're otoliths when they're in the utricle, but once they fall into the canal, they're called canalis. So, thank you for that. So, it's important to note that the diagnosis of posterior canal BPV can only be made when you see that torsional upbeating nystagmus during the Dix Hall Pike maneuver or um, testing. Uh, report of positional vertigo in itself is not enough to diagnose BPBB for the clinical practice guidelines. Okay, so now Dr. Honecker is going to show us a case. Okay, I'll do a switcher real quick. No, I'm just thinking about it. All right. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk um, through just a couple of cases. Um, related to kind of the, the biggest question that we have when patients come into the clinic, and that is, are the patient's symptoms that are these transient episodes of vertigo provoked with position changes truly related to BPPV, or could there be other uh, mechanisms that could be the cause for this? So we'll kind of walk through some cases, and the first one we have is actually a patient I saw just this past fall. This is a 77 year old female who was involved in a pretty significant motor vehicle accident. She was actually um, walking out of her driveway when, or excuse me, walking on a sidewalk when a car backed up and hit her coming out of her driveway. Um, the patient, because of this, had a sustained head injury. Um, and as a result of this head injury and from the trauma from the accident, um, reported positional vertigo. Um, significant imbalance and overall just a fear of falling that began um, and really started to um, increase a few weeks after the accident. The patient also started to notice um, shortly after the accident um, symptoms of short term memory loss um, and difficulty with word finding. Um, the patient was evaluated in the emergency room, um, subsequently saw neurology, had scans, and also had um, PT evaluation. Um, during the physical therapy evaluation, um, with the most um, frequently used diagnostic positional testing, the Dix Hall Pike, um, the patient for both the right and the left Dix Hall Pikes did not have any observable nystagmus when the patient was in the supine head hanging position. 
However, when the patient was returned to a sitting up position, the physical therapist noted this slight upbeating torsional component. And each time they perceived the torsion of the nystagmus to be to the left, so toward the left ear. The patient also endorsed um, symptoms of dizziness. Um, and after the left Dix Hall Pike, what was interesting was that the physical therapist noted symptoms of dizziness and also these kind of swaying truncal movements um, that kind of subsided after a few seconds after they returned to that sitting position. The patient was treated for left posterior semicircular canal BPPV based on the fact that they observed upbeating leftward torsion, um, even though it was kind of in this atypical pattern of a return to sit rather than having them back in the hall pipe position. Um, one thing to note with a posterior canal BPPV, the classic nystagmus that Dr. Bayer had pointed out is an upbeating, which is what we perceive with the naked eye, that's that fast phase of the nystagmus, and also torsion that you perceive toward the ear involved. So it's always the torsion that helps to diagnose the side involved. If you see an upbeating, that represents a posterior canal. If you see a downbeating, that represents typically an anterior canal presentation. So based on this, present, this pattern of nystagmus, the therapist felt it was the left posterior canal BPPV. At a second visit, the patient came back and they reported continued imbalance concerns. Um, they felt some relief of their dizziness shortly after the epley, but it really returned after about eight to 10 hours after initial visit. And it's likely that the patient perceived this return because the patient got up from a supine position this eight to 10 hours after they had their treatment, so the next day. Um, the physical therapist noted the same positional nystagmus pattern, this um, perceived upbeating leftward torsion with symptoms of dizziness, and this, again, this body sway movement upon return to sit. The patient was now treated for suspected anterior canal versus maybe a posterior canal BPPV presentation. The patient um, then had five subsequent additional therapy uh, visits, and the patient was treated for both right and left posterior canal BPPV, yet still presented signs of this upbeating possible torsional nystagmus with return to sit. So the therapist was trying everything they could within their bag of tricks to try to resolve the symptoms for the patient, um, but they were coming up without any resolution. And that's where the patient was referred to see us in our laboratory. And oftentimes what's considered best practice is that if a patient who presents with symptoms and possible signs of BPPV, as um, Dr. Bear had mentioned before, to truly make this diagnosis, fast tracking to physical therapy is the best approach. However, if they're not resolving with typical um, kind of best practice approaches, such as Epley maneuver, CMOT maneuver, and even some other um, various maneuvers to treat BPPV, it's then good to have the patient have a more thorough workup to make sure we're not missing anything. And that's why the patient was sent back to our laboratory. So when the patient was um, on our schedule, we already had a good understanding of the, the individual's history, um, what the therapist had performed in the past for um, possible treatment for BPPV. And that really led us to some clinical questions to try to delve into further what could be the cause for the patient's symptoms um, and clinical signs for the nystagmus pattern. So our clinical questions were really, does the patient really have BPPV? If we're suspecting this, what variant could cause this upbeat torsional nystagmus with return to sit? And if it is BPPV, which canal or which side is involved? Because it seemed the therapist was just kind of picking and choosing left ear versus right ear versus not really sure which canal to treat. The other question we had, though, is just based on this strange presentation, and given the fact that this patient had a history of um, head trauma due to motor vehicle accident, um, we had to wonder if perhaps there's something mimicking a pattern that looks like BPPV, but perhaps there's another culprit for this. And that's where our second question was, does the patient have central positional nystagmus with vertigo or maybe some other cause for these symptoms and signs? <laughs> 
So keeping these clinical questions in mind, and before we even saw the patient, um, we decided it would be good to do a brief review of the literature just to get a good idea of some atypical BPPV variants that could possibly cause a pattern of nystagmus that the therapist was seeing um, repeatedly upon um, Dix-Hall-Pike examinations. So um, some of the more atypical causes for posterior canal BPPV is something referred to as short arm BPPV. Um, this was first introduced by John Ose, who actually was a physician here at the clinic. Um, and for um, Dr. Ose, he identified the short arm BPPV as this otoconia in the short arm part of the semicircular canal, which is closest to the utricle. Um, and he speculated that a, a large majority of um, cases of posterior semicircular canal canalithize this type. So those having the canalis truly in the canal portion of the posterior canal um, can arise from these short arm presentations. When patients with short arm BPPV are in a Dix Hall pike position, um, Dr. O's hypothesized that um, these individuals would have this kind of persistent ipsy directional torsional nystagmus component, meaning if they're in a, a left Dix Hall pike they're going to present just with a leftward torsional nystagmus. That really didn't fit with our patient A symptoms or signs, so that led us to dig into the literature a little bit further. Um, there's been some other reports by Buki et al. in 2011, 2014 um, that further looked at um, this possibility of short arm BPPV. And in the diagram here, we can kind of see that we can have little um, canalists that are, are closer to the utricle. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the arrow okay, but we can have um, canalists that are these kind of little black circles within the long arm of the canal, um, some that could be adhered to the cupola themselves, and then some that are also on the opposite side closest to the utricle, um, referred to as a short arm. For these case series um, from 2011 and 2014, Buki et al. identified patients with vertigo upon sitting up um, after a Dix Hall pike, but without nystagmus. So these individuals didn't have nystagmus when they were down in a hall pike. When they sat back up, they also didn't present with any nystagmus, but they had this kind of strange anterior posterior truncal oscillations. So this body sway um, movement. This uh, kind of variant of what they observed for what they called short arm BPPV was typically only um, involved when they brought the patient up from one side. So if they had them do a right hall pike, perhaps sitting up would be okay, but a left Dix hall pike, perhaps they would know the um, body sway movements after that. Um, and they felt that this was kind of the subjective BPPV um, that really presented with just this abnormal body sway pattern with return to sit. Sometimes patients would also have this kind of sustained downbeating nystagmus when in adult Dix Hall Pike position, um, but when they sat back up, there wouldn't be a reversal, there would just be this truncal sway. So aspects of this pattern, at least for the body sway motion, seem to fit with our patient's symptoms and signs. Just a little bit further digging into the literature, just to make sure we weren't missing anything before we saw the patient. Um, in 2015, Venucci et al. Um, kind of hypothesized and theorized this, uh, another variant of posterior canal BPPV referred to as common crust or apogeotropic canalithiasis. Um, with this approach, you can sometimes have canalists that are stuck in the common crust between the superior and the posterior um, semicircular canals. When a person is put into a Dix Hall pike position, the canalists then move within the long arm of the posterior canal, causing this amphipedal, meaning cupula is displaced toward the utricle of the posterior canal. When the cupula is displaced toward the utricle in a posterior canal, that causes an inhibitory response. So patients would present with a downbeat kind of contratorsional eye movement. And then when they would sit up, they would be the excitatory response because the canalists would move in the opposite direction, thus pulling the cupola away from the utricle. Um, so 
while this pattern is another atypical variant, it really didn't fit with the, the signs and the symptoms that our patient presented with. So that led us to an article that came out in 2019 by um, Sococo um, et al. Um, and this, uh, the authors presented with um, kind of a case series of patients that were very similar to the Buki et al. articles. They identified 15 patients with sitting at vertigo, but who also presented with an upbeating and ipsilateral torsional nystagmus. Um, this nystagmus pattern was very short in latency. It did have a crescendo, decrescendo velocity profile. Um, and all patients had a history of recurrent BPPV, um, and even eight had previous posterior semicircular canal BPPV treated with Epley. One caveat with these patients is that all had normal neurological and ocular motor examinations and MRIs with within normal limits. This is a, a particular um, a video from the article, and what we'll see in this video is that the patient is being brought down into a left Dix Hall pipe position. I will see with the eyes, the corresponding eyes, the patient is just kind of doing some searching eye movements, but it's not until they're brought back up that we actually start to see a leftward torsion. So torsion is always with reference to the patient's right and left. So leftward torsion and slight up beating that seems to decay over time. So for these patients who presented with this kind of uh, torsional upbeating nystagmus with return to sitting, um, all patients were treated for posterior semicircular canal um, with cannula three positioning maneuvers. Um, they were treated with um, variations of the Epley, the CMON, or even kind of shortened Simon type maneuvers. Um, there was no success immediately following, but the patients were given brand dare off exercises. And Dr. Bear will go into detail in just a few moments of what brand dare off exercises are um, and how you can make recommendations for your patients to perform these. Um, after the patients were given brand dare off exercises, some had persistent symptoms, um, and it took a, a, about one, one and a half visits to resolve their symptoms. Um, when the patients came back into the clinic after the first treatment, um, a few actually had classic presentations of posterior semicircular canal BPPV, meaning when they were in the Dix Hall pipe position to the left or to the right, um, they presented with the torsional, ipsy torsional, and the upbeating nystagmus pattern. Um, one thing that they thought was that perhaps some of these patients with recurrent posterior semicircular canal canalithiasis or even um, kind of nystagmus patterns of what you wouldn't expect to see as a person is moving through a uh, canalith repositioning maneuver, um, there was some theories from this article that perhaps the persistent nature or the strange presentation of nystagmus is actually due to some sort of anatomical variant such as a canal stenosis. So what they propose is this model for these patients who have sitting up vertigo with um, upbeating and um, torsional nystagmus is that perhaps it's due to some sort of stenosis of the posterior canal itself. So we can see these different three-dimensional views of a proposed patient. For the first view, we have um, kind of a patient for a right posterior semicircular canal, the person's in a Dix Hall pipe position, and the otoconia displacement is restricted due to canal stenosis. In uh, kind of the B um, section, we have the person sitting up um, after being in the Dix Hall pipe position. And this initial sitting up causes the um, canalis to move toward the utricle, which in, um, then causes the cupula to billow toward the utricle. So this causes a brief inhibition response to the posterior canal. But then in the C um, panel, we see that the canalis then move down this um, arm of the canal and causes the cupula to move away from the utricle, which causes an excitatory response. So the brief inhibitory response in the B panel may not be observed 
um, what we see with the naked eye or even with our infrared goggles is really this excitatory response. Um, and then uh, this D is just kind of a view of sustained excitatory response, possibly due to this um, jam, due to the canal stenosis. So if we kind of think of our review of our patient, their signs and symptoms, they had ongoing symptoms of vertigo upon sitting up, which were very brief. Our uh, physical therapist noted this upbeating torsional nystagmus um, with both left and right return to sit positioning. Um, they had minimal to no nystagmus observed in the supine or head hanging positions. And when they returned to sit, the physical therapist observed this body sway, uh, significant truncal movements. So this led us to kind of think, well, maybe the patient is presenting with this new posterior semicircular canal variant, and we need to be very mindful of that when we saw them in the clinic. Um, when we saw them, we decided to do a little bit more extensive test battery rather than just a screening and treatment for BPPV because the patient didn't have resolution. Um, so we did some ocular motor examinations, and this is one, this is our smooth pursuit testing. And we can see that when the patient's eyes are to in a rightward direction, both eyes, rightward is smooth, but when the patient tries to track a moving target to the left, we have start to have some psychotic pursuit or these cogwheeling eye movements, kind of stair step approach to the eye movements to try to catch up and keep on track with the target. So anytime we see um, unilateral or asymmetrical pursuit, that's a red flag that there could be some sort of um, central um, phenomenon that's causing um, this dysfunction of the eye movements. Um, the rest of the ocular motor examination was pretty much um, unremarkable. Um, we did then go into our positional examinations, and this is just um, portions of the positional. They all kind of fit the same type of pattern. So this is where we brought the patient straight back into a head hanging position. There was no nystagmus observed whatsoever. But then when we return the patient to a sitting up position, which is what you'll see here, the patient had significant truncal sway, um, almost like body tremors at times. And what we observed actually was a pure upbeating nystagmus. We could not appreciate any torsion and we even, which isn't um, shown on this video, we even tried changing the patient's line of gaze to see if we can pull out a torsion and it pretty much was just this pure upbeating um, component. This was also apparent um, as in the other Dix Hull Pikes. Um, we did other positional testing to look for um, any evidence of horizontal um, canal BPPV, and all we saw were signs of apogeotropic nystagmus um, that really was persistent and not fitting a pattern for horizontal canal. After completing all of the positional testing, we saw again robust upbeating nystagmus with no torsional component whatsoever that um, tended to decay over time. We can see the upward direction of the nystagmus. Um, further testing was deferred just due to the patient's symptoms um, and just due to time constraints. So if we compare our patient with the, the article that was kind of our reference article before we saw the patient, um, our patient presented again with upbeating nystagmus with return to sit positioning, had some apogeotropic nystagmus on other positional testing, abnormal ocular motor performance, um, they had a past abnormal um, uh, scans just due to the head injury and hematoma um, and now are presenting with um, issues in memory and speech concerns and really no resolution of symptoms with BPPV treatment, which is very different than what we can see here from um, kind of the review of the article, the reference article that we had. So that led us to really the question of are we dealing with BPPV or could this be something else? Um, and if we think about the classic features for posterior canal BPPV, while the patient presented with this kind of um, crescendo, decrescendo nystagmus pattern, it didn't have the typical torsional component to it. Um, and that really led us to question, could we be dealing with something that's more a central positional nystagmus with vertigo presentation, which can often mimic posterior canal BPPV 
For this, patients can have triggered, triggered episodes of vertigo um, that can be positional in nature. They can have a very short latency that can look very much like classic BPPV. And then nystagmus duration can also be very similar to classic posterior canal BPPV. The difference is that the nystagmus characteristics are often pure vertical, meaning typically downbeating, but you can have cases where it can be an upbeating presentation. Um, you can have just straight torsional nystagmus or just horizontal nystagmus. Um, and for these cases, you sometimes can have cerebellar signs or oculomotor signs, which seem to fit most, um, most consistently with our patient. So due to this, the patient was actually given habituation exercises to try to help minimize their symptoms of positional vertigo rather than focusing on um, classic BPPV treatment. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Bear. He's okay. going to talk about our next case. Okay, so this is a patient, Dr. Honecker and I saw at the clinic. He was a 68-year-old male. He was previously diagnosed with right posterior canal BPPV at various facilities and was treated with multiple particle repositioning maneuvers without success, which is summarized in this table. Um, so he came to the clinic for essentially a second opinion for his positional vertigo. So. His symptoms began following knee surgery. He spent several days immobilized in a recliner chair with his neck extended backwards. His symptoms lasted less than a minute in duration and were provoked with turning his head to the right or looking upwards. Um, so his significant surgical history included a mid cervical spine fusion, but he did not endorse any pain at that time. He didn't have any other neurologic symptoms and past medical, surgical and family history was non-contributory in terms of things that we look for. So I know I'm in a theoretical room full of surgeons, but he was not interested in surgical management for treatment. He only wanted non-surgical management options, which we'll discuss later on. So his vestibular examination was normal other than the Dix Hall pike testing. So this is the right Dix Hall Pike, and here you can see he has that upbeating torsional nystagmus, the torsions towards the, the right ear. So we treated him with the Epley maneuver twice and the Samount maneuver, Samount maneuver once, and he was traveling to the Cleveland Clinic just for his vestibular evaluation. He was only in town for a few days. Typically, when we suspect a patient has BPV, we follow up with them within one to two weeks. But because of his unique situation, we had him come back in the following day. And the following day, he still had um, symptoms consistent with posterior canal BPVB. We were able to get him seen by one of our physician assistants who ordered a MRI with him without contrast. Shout out to Caitlin. Um, and one thing that we were considering is that the possibility for a cervical spine fusion surgery impacting the, the treatment due to immobility. So with the Epley maneuver, it's really important to have their neck extended at least 20 to 30 degrees past the table or chair to completely evacuate the aconia, otoconia back into the utricle. So one thing that Dr. Honecker and I recommended was he be referred to a facility with an Epley Omniac system. So in, in this chair, you're completely inside of it um, and your whole body is rotated. So it's not dependent just on your neck mobility. So there's only a few of them across the country. He flew out to one in Michigan and that's not him, but we did get pictures and it's they're pretty cute. Um, he received multiple treatments over three days on the last day. He, they didn't notice any positional nystagmus. He felt an improvement of symptoms and he actually contacted us right after his last day and he said, I'm feeling better, I'm able to golf, everything's back to normal. But then two or three weeks later, we received another message stating that his BPV had returned. So multiple failed particle repositioning maneuvers like Dr. Honecker mentioned, warrants investigation of other possible etiologies which leads us into the clinical questions for this case, which are what are other possible causes for his intractable positional nystagmus? 
And what are non-surgical management options when these traditional maneuvers do not provide resolution? So here is an expanded differential list, similar to what Dr. Honecker showed at a previous slide, um, really looking at the expected nystagmus profile and other associated symptoms with um, different possible etiologies. So Dr. Honecker already spoke about central positional vertigo with nystagmus. And again, our patient didn't have any neurological cerebellar oculomotor signs, and his nystagmus truly had that upbeating torsional component, which you typically only see vertical nystagmus with central positional vertigo. So that's a no-go. Okay, so looking at cervicogenic dizziness, um, there's no formal diagnosis for this in, in, our, in the clinic, but typically patients have report symptoms of dizziness with uh, neck rotation right and left, and sometimes that can be cap captured in our infrared video goggles. So we have our patients um, sit upright and turn their head at least 75 degrees, and we try to see if there was any nystagmus. He didn't have any, as well as he didn't have any cervical pain or um, neck-related headache, as they can sometimes have. So lastly, we considered vertebral artery compression syndrome. Um, it's also called bow hunter syndrome. Typically, patients with this um, etiology will have a mixed horizontal or downbeating the stagnus. It's not torsional, it's purely horizontal. And I wanted to show you guys. So this is what the nystagmus can look like with leftward head rotation. So you can see it's downbeating and there's a few horizontal movements. So that wasn't consistent with what our patient had. Okay. So we're gonna Say no to that one. Okay, so just based off the patient's nystagmus profile and associated symptoms, we believe his clinical presentation most closely aligned with his persistent posterior canal BPV. Um, there haven't been any documented cases in the literature where they have anyone with um, central etiologies have that perfect torsional upbeating nystagmus. Um, however, we do understand our scope of practice and know that there are necessary tests that are needed to. Completely affirm hey, that. Hey, welcome. Um, so there isn't an exact mechanism for persistent BPV, but some of the hypotheses include um, include lack of otoconia reabsorption. So when the otoconia go back into the utricle, there are dark cells around that help absorb the otoconia. Possible interlabyrinthine fibrosis or ossification mutual lesions, adherence to the membranous labyrinth, and then stenosis of the semicircular canals or otolithic jam, like Dr. Honigford mentioned. Okay, so now looking at the second clinical question. So we recommended the patient complete brand Daroff exercises at home. So originally the brand Daroff exercises were created as a solution for BPVV. The literature has found that the epi maneuver is superior in the treat for the treatment of BPVV. However, um, Brand air exercises may reduce the subjective symptoms due to BPV because you're stimulating the posterior canal. So it can, is a viable at home vestibular rehabilitation exercise. We demonstrate them in the office and then also provide our patients with a YouTube link in their after visit summary. But you guys, if you wanted to recommend them, could just give them that link. I'm sure they would do fine with it. Okay, now looking at the chair. So the it is recommend the chair is typically recommended for patients with contraindications or physical restrictions such as cervical immobility, um, but higher level evidence is needed to support its use for persistent BPVV in particular. Unfortunately, many studies um, do not use consistent or correct diagnostic criteria. There's essentially one meta analysis on this topic, and they do not accurately define persistent BPVV. They just put anyone in the study that had positional nystagmus, which as we learned earlier, isn't the, um, a correct diagnosis for BPVB. Okay, so our conclusions and clinical, clinical application, central pathologies can mimic the presentation of BPVB and it's essential to pay careful attention to the nystagmus profile and the presence of any other central signs. You can recommend brand Darov exercises for symptoms secondary to BPV and the chair, although it looks pretty cool, um, you need more evidence before we can determine its usefulness for posterior canal BPV.
Okay, great. What we'll do now, let me go ahead and get this. What we thought we would do is just um, open up the conversation for any questions you may have regarding just kind of patients who present with um, possible VPPV um, and anything else related, um, related to the kind of strange variants that we talked a little bit about today. It must have been so clear that everyone understands. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for our experts? <laughs> Time to ask. Hey, Julie or Abby, this is Penny. I might have missed it on the one that you were talking about, Julie, but what did they ultimately decide was the issue? Was it a central finding due to her head trauma? It was. That's what they ultimately decided. And was there treatment for her? Uh, what was given, at least what was last given from physical therapy was habituation type exercises to help reduce her symptoms with position changes. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Yeah, no, I don't I don't see a lot of um, general patients, but you know, sometimes patients will mention that they're having, you know, dizziness or vertigo issues. And, you know, I don't necessarily have the time to go into like a whole history since I'm working them up for something else. Um, so for patients like that, like what would be the best next step? Like, is it like, hey, talk to your primary care doctor or um, what, 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 what would be the best in terms of like next step for workup or diagnosis or evaluation. Because obviously I don't because yeah. a lot of them don't necessarily have, you know, peripheral vertigo issues. Right. I think that the biggest thing if you can take just a, a few moments out of your time as someone is presenting with dizziness to get an idea of the um, kind of what, what happened at the initial onset. Um, are there any known triggers? for this? Um, are there any associated symptoms with this that could help tease out whether or not this is something that truly is more peripheral in nature? So if it's peripheral in nature, maybe they had a really um, significant kind of vestibular crisis event such as um, secondary neuritis or labyrinthitis where the onset was very significant. It lasted for a period of days and then it started to resolve into really head movement or body movement provoked symptoms that would let us know a little bit about the nature of vestibular compensation for this unilateral event. Um, if the patient is presenting with um, associated neurologic symptoms um, in addition to the significant onset, um, then I'd be more inclined that we need to get them to, you know, further work up for anything that's a neurologic in nature. Um, if it truly is sounding that it's benign, it's sounding like it is position provoked um, and it's lasting brief without any associated neurologic signs or symptoms, then probably a fast track to physical therapy is appropriate to have them worked up and screened for BPPV. Um, the physical therapists here at the clinic are very good about sending patients to us at the vestibular lab if we have, if they have concerns that they're not resolving with their symptoms. If they have more ear related complaints in addition to their vertigo, that's where it might be a good idea to have them see us um, in vestibular audiology, or if there's concerns that it could be some other peripheral otologic um, disease, that's where we'd want to um, refer them to our colleagues in otology. So I think it kind of depends on just asking them those quick questions of, you know, what was the initial onset? What are they presenting with now? What are the triggers and what are those associated symptoms that can help to start to parse out if this is central versus peripheral? Um, don't ever be afraid to send myself or even now with Dr. Bear coming on the clinic um, cases for review that we can help you tease out kind of what are the next steps for triage. Um, that's one of the things that vestibular audiology can help with is to help um, kind of get patients on the right path for management. <laughs> 
Well, if there's no other questions, we appreciate your participation this morning and listening. Um, and feel free to shoot us any questions by email or staff messages. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, guys. Thank you, and have a great day, guys. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.